Oh, welcome to Riding Into History. I'm at a new site today. It is uh, Sea Rights Toll House, erected 1835. It was just a way for travelers on the old Route 40 here, just to the left, where they would collect the toll for any person, property, animals. I'll show you a sign up by the house here, or toll house, and it'll show you what each one was charged for each animal and each uh, any item that you had you were bringing. So let's get into it. Okay, here's a sign of the rates for what you would pay for the tolls. Washington Tavern. He built that for Judge Ewing. He built a mansion for Judge Ewing. He also built uh, the wings on to Friendship Hill, our other national park in Fayette County. So he was very accomplished and uh, he knew how to build, which comes into play a little bit later on in our story. <laughs> but in 1835, this was erected. This is the person here, Captain Delafield. He will eventually be uh, promoted to general, but through this process of the reconstruction of the National Road, he's actually uh, a captain. At the age of 15, he is both a student and a professor of mathematics at West Point. He came from a wealthy York family, could have gone into the family business. Instead, he stayed with the Army Corps of Engineers all of his life. Highly celebrated, he was at the Treaty of Ghent with Albert Gallatin. Uh, he wrote books on military strategy and on engineering, so he was very accomplished. And so during the process, he came up here. He actually lived in Uniontown uh, during the Reconstruction. He was given three responsibilities. Find a road that's going to last. The first national road, because we did not know how to build one, <laughs> fell apart in about five years. It was so highly traveled. What we did not take into account was the thawing and freezing. So it, it fell apart. Like today. <laughs> the puddles. Yeah, so he found the roads of Europe were being built by a Scottish engineer by the name of John McAdam. So he brings the process here, gives him credit, calls it the McAdamized method. And uh, so that's the road that we had. And that road is right there. That's still the McAdamized road. It is going by what is now the Stonehouse Restaurant. But that was the home of Congressman Andrew Stewart. Andrew Stewart, when he first was elected to Congress in 1820, he wanted to be on what is now called the Infrastructure Committee. He believed you had to have a strong road system in this country. His father was the superintendent of the highway. His wife's father was one of the contractors. In fact, the Castleman Bridge, that's famous. He, her, his father-in-law built that. Wow. Yes, yeah, so he had National Road in his blood, for sure. And so uh, that was his home. That was his summer home. So whenever there was a cholera epidemic or if there was anything going on, they'd go to the mountains. They believed the pure mountain air was curative, but we know he was just getting away from all the sick people. <laughs> anyway, this is from 1907. Uh, so you have uh, cars and you have wagons, horse buggies on the same road at the same time. Another thing he had to do at Delafield was to replace a bridge in Brownsville. So you were just in Brownsville. So between Brownsville and the town that that time was called Bridgeport, um, there was a suspension bridge that had been designed by James Finley. A lot of people don't know, but James Finley was from Fayette County, and he was the first to patent a suspension bridge. It became popular in Europe before it became popular in this country. But so he put that suspension bridge in Brownsville. The councils on both sides thought there was something wrong with it. So they tried to do a weight restriction, but that was the national road. Even though it wasn't a huge span, it was the national road. And so people grumbled, so they said, okay, well, January 1820, a Conestoga wagon, six horses, a driver going over it, and it fell down into Dunlap's Creek. So one of the things he had to do was to, uh, to design a bridge for that place. Well, again, he's in Europe. He sees the first cast iron bridge in the world. Is this one in England? It's in Shropshire. It is, uh, this is an important site, the first cast iron bridge in the world. 
and it's visited by people from all over the world. So the first cast iron bridge in this country is this one right here, and um, it was erected probably about, finished about 1838, and it was made right in the foundry in Brownsville. And you would have thought they would say, wait a minute, we know how to build bridges, why do we go into the bridge making business, but they didn't. <laughs> and of course then another company and other companies picked up on it. So this is going to be uh, dismantled and it is going to be restored and put right back into place. They were supposed to do it already this year, so we're oh, not wow. sure yeah, why. So the last thing he had to do was to design a toll house. He wanted to be large enough for a family man to want to live here because they were more responsible than a bachelor. <laughs> and so he liked the idea of a lighthouse, the lighthouse effect. And so, um, so that's what we have. And you'll be able to appreciate when we go upstairs. This is the oldest picture we have right here of our toll house. And we can get to see the barn. You get to see the vegetation along the road. And of course, you can see they were absolutely level with the road. We all were level with the road. But when the road was paved in, 19, in the 1930, this is 1933, now you can see it looked like Delafield built us up on a hill, but we were not built on a hill. We were level. This is 1905. That's our local historian, James Haddon, pretending to be the last gatekeeper taking the last toll, July 4th, 1905. But truth be told, there was a family living in that. It was just, but it was nice that he did because we get to see what it looked like in 1905. 1933, the tolls were still posted. So in 1858, the state wanted out of the maintenance business of this road. They asked the counties to take over, so Fayette County took over this section through uh, through all of Fayette County, and uh, anyway, so it was, um, this was auctioned off in 1858, and it became a family home. So the first family moves in here, the Gosnell family. Husband goes off to the Civil War, he dies, and, uh, and so now the widow is left without a source of income, and so she brings in nine coal miners to live here. <laughs> nine coal miners in this place. So, wow. and we have one bedroom. <laughs> so, the second gatekeeper uh, was William Banks. William Banks and his wife had eight children. And so you had eight children and Mr. and Mrs. Banks here. So he, since he was a school teacher, we know she had to have been the gatekeeper during the day and she's not referenced at all in history. So we have a, a mannequin dressed as Mrs. Banks in the other room. So, <laughs> so we'll give her at least that kind of notoriety. So, um, so after the last family left, and we do have a picture of them right here. This is the face and makers. They are coming into the back door. Why? Because they closed this door. This became mom and dad's bedroom, and they had two daughters, and the daughter slept in the upstairs bedroom. And we know that because one of our visitors here years ago played with those girls. She was friends with those girls. And so that's how we know how they made it work. Never had running water in here. Never. Still don't. But what we had outside was a huge well. Why was it huge? Because underneath this, there's an aquifer. Mm -hmm. So always an ample supply of water. And it's still there. They did a road construction project. It's still there. Was it okay for the people traveling to water their horses or whatever, and, or to get water for the oh, travelers? Probably. That would have been okay to do that. But the gatekeeper went outside. Nobody really came, came inside, in. but okay. I think that would have been okay for that. So we're proud to have these documents here. These are in the hands of uh, Captain Delafield. You can see his signature right there. Uh, that's correspondence that was sent to William Hopwood. William Hopwood built two toll houses. And here's his contract. He was paid $1,530 to build two. He built the two in the mountains. He got permission to build those out of stone. And here's Captain Delafitt's blueprints that he sent to William Hopwood. So it's wonderful that we have those. And those were recently uh, restored. So uh, this is William Hopwood sitting over here, just so you get an idea of, of how he looked. And the one that he built, Addison is still standing. And the one that he built that was nearer for necessity, that, of course, is long gone. This one was interesting, West Alexander. Interesting why? Because if they didn't become a family home, they were just left for ruins and they fell in. But that one actually became a speakeasy during the Prohibition. 
and that after the prohibition, a farmer's story is hanging it. And in 1958, he, he said, please, somebody take it, restore it, but nobody wanted it. So that we could have been saved. So after the last family left, the highway department stored dynamite in here, and the dynamite did go off. And that's when I said the fact that Hugh Graham knew how to build came into play. So this is what we look like right here after the dynamite. That's about nine months after the dynamite had gone off. It did not destroy it. There's a couple books that says that it was destroyed. That's proof, of course, it was not destroyed. Uh, what you see, all the walls are still standing. Uh, the roof was not blown off by the dynamite. It instead was uh, neglected like after that. Our local state rep loved the history of the toll house. His grandfather had been one of the old pipe boys. He's the one who got the sponsors to be able to provide the money for the restoration, which happened in the 1960s. So that's why we're still standing. <laughs> <clears throat> Isn't that what happened to the Acropolis, I think? They stored the dynamite in there yeah. and during the Napoleonic Wars. I think the uh, cannonball went in there and it just blew what up. Yeah, <laughs> I think oh, I saw yes. that. Please, please take one of those. Uh, this is Andrew Stewart. We talked about Andrew Stewart. That's Andrew Stewart. We have this bridge painting at our museum, so that's a photograph of him. But good friends with Abraham Lincoln. He had given 67 speeches for Abraham Lincoln. He named his youngest son Albert Gallatin after, of course, Albert Gallatin, the great statesman and the great uh, Secretary of Treasury, Thomas Jefferson, who was the one who put the funding mechanism together for the National Road. He was at Ford's Theater, his son, the youngest son, the night of the assassination, and it said he was the first person to rush to the side of President Lincoln to try to save his life. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, but. Uh, like I said, Andrew, Andrew Stewart cared about this, the expanse of this country. He knew that we had to have a good road system. Is it the one for Ohio Power too? Wasn't it Stewart? He, he yes. wrote a book called "Going to Ohio Power or something. And he read, they owned it all. They called yeah. that Stewart Township because mm -hmm. they owned all of that area. Yeah. So this is a ledger going back to the 1840s. Belonged to this gentleman over here, Lucius Stockton. Lucius Stockton had the National Road Stage Company, very successful. This just shows you some of his expenditures, and of course, if you could translate that into days, dollars, it's a lot of dollars that he has coming out. Um, and then he got the smart idea. He used, to release the money for the reconstruction, he used the, the law that said the US mail is conveyed upon the road is for the good of the country. Um, so then, Lucius Stockton realized he doesn't have to pay for tolls if he has mailbags. So then he distributed the mailbags so every single stagecoach he had, so now he's not paying for any tolls. Well, that irked this man over here, William C. Wright. William C. Wright had been the, uh, the superintendent of the highway at the time. This was his tavern, which was just up the road um, at the traffic light. That was the C. Wright Tavern. Okay. Yes, it was one of the most popular taverns along the National Road. It stood until the 1940s when the current occupant's husband went off to jury duty while there he has a heart attack. He was in the hospital and she unfortunately burned the house down. Oh. So all those years it stood. And uh, then there was mystery about it, that there were diamonds that had been hidden. So forever people wanted to, to try to dig up and do you know, metal detecting and the whole thing. So, yeah, there you go. So. I, I've t spoken with the Rangers at uh, Fort Necessity too, and I said, why can't like you get some people that metal detect to work with the Rangers, you know, to do an excavation? You could pinpoint where it's at and the depth and everything, and then they can dig it up. And I said, then you could display it before it's gone to history, and so future generations can see it. And they, they say, we're they told no. That's not in their, yeah, that's not their mission. We're doing a dig just up the road from us uh, at our museum, and they dug down about that far when they already started finding coins, some from the 1700s, silver, Spanish silver. Wow. Yeah, just like yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to say, I, should have I saw them, because a yeah, long time ago, yeah. whoever lived in that house, they were having a yard sale. They were getting rid of the stuff that was in the house. They had like a giant yard sale about uh, 10, 15 oh, years ago. Oh, our museum? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, I don't know who lived in it, but when they were gone, they had, they, 
had all kinds of stuff in the yard and I ended up buying a couple of books that I have in my house from oh, from the thing and now I see they're excavating out there and I always wondered why they're out there across the, the green, road well that's the green tree tavern and Abel Colley who built our museum Abel Colley that was his first place he didn't build it it was a log cabin he didn't build it it was already a functioning inn or a tavern a stand they call that one a stand and so but then they said he was a farmer, but they said he missed being a tavern owner, so he built Abel Collins and put a tavern in there. So there's a tavern room in there. And uh, but anyway, so but but they're doing. They just found another foundation. They're real excited about that. Uh, so they're trying to figure out exactly which way the road was going and what structure did they find. But like I said, they have found some interesting artifacts already. So and and they did it. Without much digging at all, they always yeah, the pit doesn't look very big. It doesn't have to be, but again, they found another another foundation, so they're excited about that. But I think the road was very wavy. You know, uh, there's one place that one of the archaeologists actually it belongs to her, into her family, and it's not facing the right way. Well, if it's not facing the road, that means the road went around <laughs> that way. So yeah. So there's a lot more than just digging to find artifacts. It's really trying to figure out the, the road itself. So. GPR would help, but those are not cheap to have yeah. those. Yeah. This is a professional archaeologist. He was a professor at Cal, and so it's a Monyon chapter of the, yeah, of, for that mm -hmm. archaeological club. So. But this mm -hmm. is a, a newspaper clipping from 1839. And it, it is how it gives us the name of our gatekeeper, John McClure Hassam, and we were called Gate 3. We were never called Sea Wright's Toll House. Never, <laughs> ever, ever. So, And this shows you uh, the National Road going through Fayette County. So from the Yalkagany and the Great Crossings Bridge, which is now submerged under the Yalk Dam, all the way up to Brownsville, this was a 635-foot long spans over the Monongahela. That was put up by a private company in 1833. It was taken down in 1910 but because the riverboat captain's complaint. It was too hard to maneuver. Stacks are getting taller. You can see one right there. It looks like it is right up to the top of the, of the bridge itself. There were two long tunnels, one that went west, one went east, but now you had automobiles and you had horse and buggies in the same very long dark tunnel and so that was not the best environment either so and that was a toll bridge so anyway so yeah they was up and tore down and we did not have that bridge replacement until four years later and so the people had to go by ferries there were two ferries in, in brownsville we talked about the gatekeeper we talked about the family who first part of this after it was auctioned off the Gosnell. Well, here is William Gosnell. He was the son of the, the widow whose husband went off in the Civil War, and he is standing in front of the toll house in Uniontown. So, Union, so Fayette County built four toll houses. They weren't occupied during the day. It was only for operations purposes. So that's, it was in Uniontown. Here's the one that was in Hopwood. We have the one that's in Brownsville right here. And I've noticed this is that the posts that are right here, those were the posts that were at Sea Rights at Gate 3, and that is what stopped the traffic. A chain was put over there, and that's what stopped the traffic. And you can see how either large they were or how small the, the toll houses were. <laughs> the other one was in Jockey Hollow, so that was right from Somerset County, right? It would have been right here, right, as you crossed over the bridge. So, and you know that bridge, when they pull the water out, hold the water back, if we have a drought, that bridge pops back up again. Oh, wow. And people actually walk across <laughs> it. So, so those are some nice pictures. So by 1870s, Harper's Magazine dispatched a reporter, said, uh, tell us what you see on the National Road. Well, and he wrote that there's trees growing up in the middle of it. He says, but I learned that snakes had learned a safe place to sun themselves was in the middle of the National Road. <laughs> so it's just a fun way of saying the road is dead. And of course, then somebody went and got in the automobile, we're back in business, and Fayette County became the place for the captains of industry to come. This is the place they stayed at the Summit Hotel, still there on the top of the mountains. And that was um, because 
of the mountain climb all the way up to the summit, they said, if your car could make it all the way up to the summit, you had a good car. <laughs> and even into the 1930s, 1940s, I see ads that were in the magazines that said this car bested the summit. So, so that's part of our history. I think I read somewhere too that Uniontown was like the richest city in the country at one point because of all the coal barons and, yes. and stuff, which is yes. why they built the yes. summit in. Yes. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it was predicated on the on the stability of J.D. Thompson and his bank. Uh, J.D. Thompson. This is the watery trough that was actually his. He built that. That was for all the men to come and play. J.D. Thompson himself wasn't a gambler. He wasn't a drinker. But he knew that his friends were, so he built that, and that just became an interesting place for them to gather. Unfortunately, it burned out in 1914, but when J.B. Thompson's bank failed in 1915, that's what hit, that's what hit, you know. Unfortunately, it was just a cascading event, and so a lot of people lost their money. Yeah. Some got some of it back, some didn't wait, and they committed suicide. So it was really a dark part in our history. He was spending money that he didn't have. He was spending other people's money in the bank. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't mean, because he was still rich on paper. They said if he had been able to survive this when his creditors came uh, calling, he would have had $750 million or something like that. Wow. But unfortunately, let me just. <laughs> the area that got the most damage from the, from the dynamite. Uh, and pretty much it was centered around the fireplace. Well, Hugh Graham, again, the one who built this, had built a church just up the road, and that church, unfortunately, was struck by lightning, and it burned, but the bricks were still standing. And so those bricks uh, were made at the same time as the toll house, and so, uh, so you can see those are the old bricks that match perfectly with the toll house. Behind you is an interesting part of that on the floor over there. But what you see actually is a tombstone, and that side says Chief, going down vertically. And then you turn it around, and you can see, it's hard to see if you put a light on it, but it says Chief Sunset. Can you see the S-U-N-S? Oh, and yeah. Moon, M-O-O-N, 1812. So we know he's coming to Fayette with his people. When he takes ill, he dies right along here. And a farmer took pity, buried him, carved the tombstone. And so um, we believe that he was hired by the U.S. government before 1812. And unfortunately, he didn't make it. Wow. So, so anyway, so a, a farmer's plowing in 1980 up the pups and donated it to the society. So is, is grief is known or is it just lost to? Lost. Henry Clay is called the fog over the water. Here's Henry Clay with that very sweet float kind of forehead. Um, we loved him. We named the township after Henry Clay. Of course, he was from Kentucky, but our farmers loved him. They knew that we were going to have uh, some good groves in this uh, area. So, uh, And that is Albert Gallatin right there. Um, you know, Albert Gallatin came to this country, they were rather loving on the heads of, of the royalty there. And even though he wasn't quite at that level of royalty, nevertheless, they didn't know how far that was going to spread. So Albert Gallatin came here. He was fascinated by Native Americans. That was one of the draws. And he ended up transcribing, phonetically transcribing Native American languages, including the Mayan language. Oh, wow. He was a surveyor, a mathematician, and Statesman, we are in his debt. If you go down to the, the Treasury Department, you're going to see Alexander Hamilton on one entrance and Albert Gallatin on the other. Um, he was the longest serving Treasury. Yes, he was. And he was that. Yes. And I, I think he helped out with the Whiskey Rebellion, too. He did. <laughs> he did. He was sympathetic to the farmers. No, he also had a distillery in his, <laughs> you know, in his area. So, yes, he, he was sympathetic. Um, you know, rye was the unofficial drink of the pipe. Even children were given rye. Why? Because you couldn't always trust your water source. Case in point over here, going back to William Seabright, who was the superintendent of the road, so 
William Seabright, in 1852, he's ready to be elected Secretary of the Canals uh, when he's campaigning, he drinks cane and water, and he's dead in two days. Oh, wow. And he was a healthy man up until that time. So, I think that's why they drink a lot of wine in Europe, because of the water, too, so they would have the wine to drink. And... Oh, yeah. And it is delicious. <laughs> I had a daughter who lived in France for 18 years. <laughs> You have to duck. You're taller than me too. You have to duck <laughs> the top of the stairs. They weren't steep. very tall then. Yeah, you're steep, and they weren't tall here. So, and that's a long, but there's nothing to see in it because they put our fireplace. I mean, our furnace. So right there is where it's low. So, we imagine that the widow got the bedroom altar herself. And we're thinking probably that the, uh, the the coal miners and the children probably slept in that loft. But you can see you have to literally jump inside to get inside mm -hmm. that. So, but this was a busy highway. That gatekeeper could have to collect tolls from 250, 275 wagons in a day, not even in a week, in a day. One time, 4,000 hogs came through here, so for every six, for every 20, they collected six cents. So that was, uh, it was a huge job. Yeah. The first gatekeeper only lasted a few years. Uh, William Bates lasted a little longer, then we had two more after him, and uh, so. And travelers could come day or night, or just usually during the day? During the day, as long as they could, they, all, they had lights on, but that was to be seen rather than to see. And you know, if you just had a bunch of stagecoaches who cut into the roadbed, you're not going to want to be traveling at night. You're going to want to see what's in the middle of the road. Speaking of roads, on that ridge over there was the original Colonel Bird's Road, which was a supply route to Fort Redstone in Brownsville. Mm -hmm. And people were still using that old road that was built in the 1750s. They were using that and not paying the tolls. <laughs> so they got around it. Yeah. Kind of like taking 857 and missing 43. <laughs> yes, a little bit. So, but it was, um, you know, at the end of the day, they put in a hard day's work. And uh, so that mattress, which is made out of straw with feather tick over it, at the end of the day, you're tired. You don't care if it's lumpy, bumpy, you're tired. <laughs> so, anyway, so this is the original flooring up here in the original. Uh, steps going up. So uh, the downstairs with the dynamite and the roof might be put back on. They they replaced that flooring with uh, a poor choice. It was very expensive, but it was red oak, uh, white planks. So when people walk in it today, they think it's probably some sort of engineer, man-made engineer, because nobody puts white planks like that made out of red oak. That's meant for furniture, you know, cabinet kind of. So that would be one thing that I think was probably a mistake that the company who got the contract to restore this did. They did more of a renovation, I think, than the restoration. They had put very fancy wallpaper on the walls. Mm. This is good. <laughs> this was done again in 1990. So this would have been very much similar to uh, what it was. And um, you can go to Addison. They're not open often, but when they are, It'd be interesting for you to go there and compare. I love this staircase, though. I've taken a picture from up there, just a nice swirl. Thank you very much for the, the tour, but I don't think I got your name or anything. If you wanted to say your name or anything. Or... It's Christy Buffalo. Oh, okay. I'm the president of the Fayette County Historical Society. Oh, okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice yeah. to meet you, too. <laughs> Both of you. So. All right. Yeah, thanks for, for all the information and the tour and everything. It was great. Very welcome. Okay, I'm just going to do a quick little wrap-up. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, it was more 
information than I thought and I've you know been around in the area my whole life and didn't know that all that information was right there and I've bypassed it for many many years so this is one more good stop for people to make and it's a nice place to get some information and to see it so with that I'm going to wrap it up and I uh, hope you like the video and you subscribe to the channel and with that I'll see you next time in writing into history